we had the privilege of going on a mission trip to the beautiful country of India. And um, it was kind of really interesting from the very beginning, trying to figure out where we were going to go, what we were going to do. Uh, it was all very complicated, and um, a couple of, of last-minute um, arrangements were done. But we were finally off, and for a lot of the people in my class, it was their first time uh, not only flying, but just leaving the country in general. Wait, I think so. Well, there, there was a good group of us that hadn't ever gone anywhere over, and definitely never been in a plane for that length of time. Um, and by the time, oh man, it, it was generally speaking a very um, kind of okay trip, um, aside from the fact that there were a couple sick people and we were worried about our entry to um, India. But when we finally arrived there, uh, I remember I had been telling Dylan that when you travel with me, something's bound to go wrong. Because for all my friends that know me, I have a terrible flying history. I always miss my flights. I always get delayed. I always get held up somewhere. Um, or something bad happens whenever I fly. So I told him that something bad was bound to happen. And he told me that all of his flights were like really, really boring. So we're probably going to cancel each other out. And we did for, for the majority of the trip. By the, but by the time we finally got there, it was like 3 in the morning. And when I finally came around to, it was my turn to get my visa stamped on my passport, um, the guy asked me if, if I was, you know, from the U.S. And obviously I'm not. I'm, I'm a Colombian citizen. So he asked me if I had been there recently. And... I had been there just this Christmas. And so he um, told me that I needed to have a certificate for a yellow fever shot. And turns out I did not know that I needed that. So although I do have that shot, I did not have the record with me. And uh, it was already hectic enough uh, trying to make sure that everybody got through, that th we didn't get sent back because uh, just as Mr. Pruitt was saying this, this morning, as it is illegal in certain countries to share the gospel, that is also the case in India. It's not illegal to be a Christian, it's just illegal to convert somebody else to Christianity. So going there, uh, what we were doing was not necessarily uh, the, I guess... It questionably legal, yeah, that. So um, it, it was already hectic enough because of that. And then getting held up was just kind of like the culmination to all of the nervousness and everything that could go possibly wrong did go wrong. Um, and so the guy told me that I was going to have to get sent back. And I just sat there thinking, uh, Lord, I, this has been my dream forever because since I was a child I always wanted to go to India so um, just being so close and then getting ready to be sent back all by myself I just I was really worried about that and I was praying to God um, and it's kind of interesting how this happened I'll go quickly try to skip some of the details the guy told me to go to the back there was this little section that they had uh, placed to scan people for COVID because this was when it was just barely starting out um, and he told me to go back there and that one of the nurse people or doctors were going to check me and then they would um, give me a shot. But when we get there, when we got there, lo and behold, there was nobody and there were no uh, yellow fever shots available. So he just told me that I was in bad luck and I was going to have to go back. And we were just, he called somebody to come over to let him know what to do. And I was praying so hard, and I felt this impression to just start talking to the person. Because he looked like he was really frustrated. He'd been having a long night. And, you know, the people that you meet, they're just people. 
like everybody else, they have families, they have compassion too. And I felt the impression to just look at him as a, as a regular person and just ask about his life. And so I started talking to him. I found out that his daughter was also in 12th grade. She was about to graduate. You know, she was uh, dreaming of going over, coming over here to the United States to study. And we just have it, started having a nice conversation with the guy. And then by the time his friend came around, he told him that he had to send me back. And like I knew it by the way that he was looking that it was like hopeless. And so as we were walking back, I asked him, so what happens now? Do I have to leave? And he's like, just follow me and stand over there. And um, to make a long story short, he, after a couple, 10, 15 minutes, called me over to the desk and he told me, listen, this can cost me my job. Don't tell anyone. And next time you come to India, make sure to bring a yellow fever card. He stamped my passport and he sent me on. And just like that, we were off. And praise the Lord, because there was no way that I was going to be able to, to make it on that mission trip. But the Lord worked things out, and not only then, but also just at other times too. And that was, that was just a little bit of the story of getting there. All right, well, um, going into a new country, um, well, has its differences to the United States. Um, well, some of the first impressions, as soon as we landed in the airport, obviously, everyone's a lot darker than us. So that's off, that's first. Like, and it's not, like, it's not like the United States where there's multiple different cultures. They're just all Indian. So when we got there, that, that was a little different. And some of the one of the first things we heard, well, also the, they drive on the left side. But um, one of the first things that um, caught our attention is that all of the vehicles have different types of horns. So here in America, you might have like the, 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 like just different tones, but over there, they're completely different. Like, they're like, Doo -doo. and some of them were like, Doo -doo 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 -doo. and like almost no joke, every car had a different horn, where there is a different key, different, no, and that really stood up because that's, it's very unique to the country, but not only that, and actually we had a, but it was nearly 18 hours flying there, and then when we got there, we had a six hour drive, so we got to hear a lot of it. Um, but also, the vehicles there, they don't really have like a weight limit. So they basically, um, yeah, they, they really fill up their vehicles. Like, I think there was a, I don't know if we have a, no, I probably don't have a picture. But basically, if, if my finger here was a vehicle, it would probably be something like that filled with hay. Like, if you turned, it would look like it was, oh, if you turned, it would look like you're about to lean, the car's about to lean over. Um, and you could really tell the difference between the United States and India that the, we, in the United States, a lot of things are a lot more advanced. And the restrooms were different. That's all I say for that. And actually, in the vehicles of transportation, a lot of them actually, these are actually kind of like taxi cabs. They're, um, those were some of the most commonly used transportations that, and a lot of motorcycles. Um, something like that. In our, whenever we, uh, people came to our meetings, one of those would come in there, so you see it's stuffed inside and there's people like on the outside trying to stay in. So there is a, um, I think if you were to count the seats, there's like six of them, but there is something around 18 of them in there. So um, it's really interesting because, and it, um, it's different in the villages than it is in the actual cities. So, and you can really tell the difference. You know, here in America, we're really blessed. Even like, even in, I guess you could say the, the low class neighborhoods, it's like, you can really see the difference between a third world country and a first world country. And I'm not even sure if India is considered third world or not, but basically um, it, they're not quite as enriched in goods, so to speak. And you could see the, it's a completely different culture shock. And even the way they said yes. So we say yes like this, right? When they said yes, they're like, oh, okay. They, they shook side to side. So um, it was a bit new, um, at least when I was asking someone a question, it was a yes or no question, and they're like, okay. So, and I thought they weren't, they didn't understand my question. So I had to, I repeated my question three times. Um, and, then, and then my translator told me, oh no, he's saying, yeah, that's fine. I was like, oh. And, so it's just different culture. And well, and you're never supposed to shake hands with your left hand. 
for reasons untold. So um, you always shake with your hand. It was very offensive to shake with your left hand. And you didn't point with your finger. You always pointed with your hand. So it's like if you look over here or look over there, you would never point with your finger. And a lot, all of these things, were, they were telling us all of these things. And it's, it's a, you can really tell we're in a different culture. Um, and it's, we are blessed here. And that's just a little introduction of some of the first impressions. That's actually uh, Fajarli Academy right there. Um, it was about a, um, it's a small school of only about 500 students. Um, um, it's much different compared to Washington Hills. Um, but, you know, for being in a, a different country, we are blessed with uh, a lot of accommodations that really we shouldn't have had. It's like even our rooms had AC. And we were really blessed. And even then, also, even the kids were a blessing to us. And then, uh, and, yep. Okay, so, the, th these pictures are just some of, like, the kids all in their places. And so, I'm going to try explaining our schedule when we got there. So, we would start with breakfast, and if I'm wrong, you guys just correct me. Which we would, we would wake up from anywhere from 5.45 to, like, 7 or even 8. I don't remember. What time was breakfast? It wasn't was necessarily because we wanted to. Was breakfast 8 o'clock? No, 8.45, right? It, like at 8. It's been a while, well, somewhere sorry. around those lines. It was sometime in the morning, I know that. I believe it was 8.45, but it usually started at 9, no? Okay, so it was, sorry, 7.45. So breakfast is around 7.45, but sometimes it opened at 8. Yeah, something around that. And so we'd have breakfast along with like a worship talk. And then right after that, at nine, we had to do like um, a week of prayer. So we were usually kind of rushed to get into there. And so we'd do a week of prayer. We'd have like a little um, health talk sort of thing for the kids. Then we'd go... Um, sing for them for a while, which they really liked learning new songs, as we found out. So we taught them every children's song we knew, um, and they were very energetic about it. Um, so then we would uh, give them like a little presentation, a talk. So Moses had this great idea we could like have the kids uh, participate, and we did like little sort of skits. And there you see Colton, he's falling over because he's Goliath. And um, that kid over there was doing David. We did a story of, yeah, David and Goliath. We did the um, Ungrateful Servant, that one too. And then after all of the, uh, the talking, then we would give them pages to color. So this is Colton. He's handing out crayons. And they're little, you know, the little box crayons with like five colors. And they really, really like the color, like all the way from the what graders, the kindergarten, all the way to like 10th standard, which is like 12th grade equivalent. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So those are teachers too. They, they like coloring too. So that was something that they were really into. And we'd have to like sh almost shoo them out because they had classes. So every time we'd have to go through and take their crayons before like they stayed there forever. And then that was the first part of the day. After that, we'd have um, just our class. We'd have like a little meeting to go over what we were doing for the next day for like the children's meetings. And then the rest of the day was sort of like prep because by the time we finished the children's meeting, it was generally around lunchtime. And so we would eat and then we'd spend the rest of the day really preparing or if we had homework then we'd do that too because we weren't exempt from that. Um, so one and then also we'd uh, get to know the kids a bit. Just we'd take walks around, meet them and it was fun. They were intrigued by us. And okay so one thing that I learned well, first of all, let me give a little explanation. So the sir, they, uh, it is written. We went with it is written, and they gave us um, sermons to use, like on slides. Well, as we went over those sermons, we're like reviewing them. We realized that they weren't exactly, how how should I say, it, catered toward the people over there because 
I, one, one of the intros for the slides, for example, was saying like, you know, do you feel safe when you go outside? Like, you know, do you feel that you need to lock the door to your house? And ironically, you know, the funny thing, yeah, they don't have doors. Some of their houses are just three walls with a roof. And it's just, you know, there's no door and that's it. So there were a bunch of things like that that we realized, that, well, there's some problems. So then we decided that, well, you know, we're going to write our own things. So, yeah, and we learned that one, of, to, one thing to be very thankful for is our Bible Docs Bible because we used a lot of those references. And you can see me right there, and that's, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, for those of you that don't know, as seniors, we have to take a Bible class for our one semester, and it's called Bible Docs, and it's short for Bible Doctrines. And part of the class requirement is that we get a Bible and we mark out Bible studies. So we have, you know, we have like one verse, and then we mark out where the next verse for the Bible study is, and then so on and so on and so on, right? So we realized that that was really helpful to have when you need to write up a sermon and you have like three hours to do it. So that was a real blessing to have one of those. And yeah, we had to pull those out. So that was generally our schedule for today. And Nathaniel, you could talk about what we did at night then. Well, so one of the things that won my heart in India were the children. I absolutely, I love every little child that I see, most, most little children. But uh, I fell in love with all, almost all 500 students there. They, I love spending time with them. I loved playing with them. And so I just really grew to connect with them. And you know, it was so it was so nice. Like we we did week of prayer for them each morning, right? And like you know, we would share with them, and you know, they were you know they were so excited to you know um, to see us and to and to um, learn and to color and you know all this stuff, and that just it was it was just such a good experience seeing how that how we were reaching all those kids, and so that was definitely something that. I was like, it, it, when I went to India, it confirmed my love for, for young children and for, you know, younger people. And so, yes, at night, what we did at night. So we were working with It Is Written, and we had, there was seven of us seniors who went to India, plus, you know, a few more It Is Written crew, and Mr. and Mrs. Riddle, who were sitting right there. They were our wonderful, they were absolutely wonderful um, show chaperones. And um, so we all, what we did is none of us were together for the evening meetings. And we would each have a, um, we would each have a partner who would help us, you know, um, do like the sermon or do the health talk and the children's story and stuff. And then we'd have our translator. And so we would each go from the school, which is where we were based at, at Farley Adventist Academy. We would all go from the school at around average time of like 6.30 at night. And we would drive to our stations. And those stations, well, some people's stations were 20 minutes away from the school. And some people's stations, like mine, were an hour and a half away. And so it just varied on the, how long the car ride was. But anyways, so... You get there, and at most of our meetings, there was a ton of more kids that I fell in love with. And so uh, the, all the kids there were so excited. They knew less Engli English, so it was a little bit harder to communicate with them, but you know, you still found ways. And um, there was, at my meetings every night that in my village that I would go to, there was about... Um, a little over 300 people, I would say, that would come every night, and we would give, um, we would give a children's story, we'd give a health talk, um, we would um, teach, me and my partner would teach the kids um, songs, and uh, of course we would give them a sermon, and, okay, yeah, so that is, that's Jose's um, tent, anyways, so basically the places where we met, they weren't like buildings, buildings, 
Um, they were basically like you'd have these curtains basically strung up beside the road, kind of, and then you'd have chairs, and then in front, all the kids would sit on the floor. Girls on one side, guys on the other. And then you would have a podium, and um, yeah, and that there were some more pictures of the evening meetings of the village, in, in the village and stuff. And so it was just a big, 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 big blessing to to share and to and to try to reach people, some who had never even heard the name of Jesus before. And there's Jose saying with the kids. Yeah. Anyways. Do you think that we had absolutely no problems this mission trip? I wish I could say that. I wish we could all say that. But there was a lot of difficulties. One of the, one of the first difficulties for me was I got an email from India that was a threat message saying that as soon as I arrive in India that they would send me back. They said, you're not allowed to do any evangelistic meetings or any of that sort. And how they figured it out is because they looked through a donation page. And they looked up um, the web address that I never posted online, except I kept it on the donation page and just left it there, forgot about it. And somebody was looking at it from India. And so that was one of the first issues. And then Darlene mentioned the situation with the officers at the beginning. They were checking our... Um, the reason why we're coming to the country, and we have to tell them um, not that we're missionaries, but we're tourists. And some of that was a challenge for us because um, it kind of seemed like we were lying to them. And so once we got to the place, uh, I'm trying to remember. There were so many, there's so many issues. I can't remember all of them, though. <laughs> okay. So I remember that some of us, well, me particularly got sick really bad over there in that country. I got the stomach virus, and I was constantly just staying inside. Also, Jose was sick when he first came. Oh, yeah. Came. yeah. Jose was sick. Basically, a lot of us were sick around the time where we were leaving to go. And, yeah, it was, and, yeah, like half the class was sick. Yeah, and then... Before we went, we heard about the COVID-19 virus, and we're like, yeah, that's a joke. It's not going to get us. <laughs> well, guess what? We're all sitting here and wearing masks, so that's reality now. All right, so, yeah, so we got sick a lot. We ate the food. It was amazing at first, and then everything started tasting like the same thing, you know, all curry and then more curry. Finally, we went to restaurants. We're like, hey, can we have some noodles? We don't want curry anymore. Even their pizza was curry, and I ordered that on accident. Hey, so, Moses, what about, you could tell them about um, when the police came to. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, in the meetings, there was a lot of young people, and a lot of young people had their cell phones, and they're like coming to us, they're like, hey. Selfie? 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 <laughs> Selfie? That's like one of the only English words they know like sometimes. The only English word. And we say, oh, no, 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 we can't do it because blah, 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 and they're like, Selfie? And it's like, okay. <laughs> Well, I guess they didn't understand us. Um, yeah, they love selfies over there in that country. They're just catching on, so you know they're all about selfies over there. Anyways, one person was preaching, and they got a picture taken and posted on social media in India. And you know, when you post things on social media, it spreads like wildfire, especially if it's things that are, you know, going against the rules. So. We all had to stay inside the campus of the school we were staying in. And the police visited that campus uh, one day. And I believe it was nighttime. The police visited. And the leader of that campus, of the administration, he talked with the police all night, begging, begging that um, um, the situation, saying, hey, you know, these people, you know, you've got to have mercy on us. And the police officers said, we're, we're giving restrictions and say, no, we can't do this. And so we decided to move everything to the campus because everything that's inside a campus, you can do whatever you want. The government can't enforce their rules. And so we kept everything, all the baptisms, all the meeting, not all the meetings. Um, we only did like week of prayer at that time. Yeah. So when we so. got uh, locked down on campus, what we ended up doing was we did week of prayer in the morning and afternoon. 
for the kids. And so, ironically, we were told that we would have no kids' meetings when we went to India, and nearly half of it was kids' meetings. Yeah, most all of it, that is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's us doing uh, some night meetings. It's kind of dark. We did a lot of sort of illustration things, try to get them involved, and yeah. And then I remember throughout the week, um, a lot of us were separated. We were just doing different things throughout the day, but we never really like talked with each other for like the first week. We didn't talk with any, we were, we were not united. And we were just doing all our own things. We thought that we had the energy to keep going, to do everything on our own. We thought that we could preach these sermons. We thought we could reach these people. But we realized that ministry is not about us. Ministry is never about us. It should never be. And so one day, towards the end of the mission trip, we finally got together as a group, and we started to pray. The very first thing that we should have considered when we first stepped on India, Indian, uh, in the country of India, we didn't pray. And we prayed with each other, and we also talked about the things we were thankful about. And after that experience, I can tell you that that was one of the most powerful experiences in this whole mission trip. This class was united, and we, we sincerely cared about each other. We wanted to do God's work together. And so I would say that was one of the blessings at the place. We got, we got the energy and the strength, not, not from ourselves, but we got the support from each other and also the support from God. So I believe that's why we were able to have such a great time. We did also have a medical center and that was um, located in one of the classrooms in the school. It was in the morning that they would go to the different villages and um, they would see people and, you know, they were like, the, peop it w the people, of course, they would tell them what they were going through, pain, um, and the nurses offered them, like, medicine, stuff like that. Um, half of the nurses were from a school from India and um, they were still in school and the others were... Yeah, so you can see half of them were Indians and half of them were American. And, uh, um, but when the police didn't let us go out, they brought the villagers to the school and that was when um, they were um, treating the patients inside one of the classrooms. And for the meetings, there was like around maybe more than 2,000 people coming like in total on um, the meetings. Um, like, I don't know who said that we had partners and then, you know, for example, me and Mrs. Riddle went to a village. It was like around maybe 30 minutes away. I think ours was the closest. It was the closest. Oh, 15 minutes, Never mind. He beat me. But some of them were like an hour and something away. So some people got really late at home. Even though you were the closest, you got really late. Yeah, so anyways. Um, baptized, there was like 900 plus people getting baptized. So the baptisms were, was being held inside the campus. Um, as you can see right there. And I don't know what that is. So interestingly enough, because they have really, really dry seasons where it doesn't rain at all, they keep their little fruit trees or shading trees, whatever, in these things. So that is actually a huge um, tree pot, yeah, pretty much. And they'll fill it with dirt and they'll water that. But it happened to be that that one was empty. And so they filled it up with water and they never, they never drained it until we were gone. And so literally all of the baptisms that happened, happened in there in the same water. But the people were really grateful for it. And it was great because since it's inside the academy, like I said earlier, it's not necessarily um, legal to convert people. So you can get in a lot of trouble if they see especially Americans uh, at these sites. So most of the baptisms you'll see, you won't see us in the pictures because um, we weren't allowed to be 
be there. Um, and actually, the baptisms, the 900 plus baptisms, um, were over a span of about three days. So it's just all day. Actually, when, um, while we were actually, that's about how long the police kept us um, on campus. So um, we had one pastor on, um, with us, and he was literally at the baptismal pool the entire day. All of the pastors there were there for the entire day just baptizing people for three days straight, like from morning until evening. And you, um, like we're, we're like um, on campus doing our things, right? And we just see constantly every few minutes uh, the, those little taxi cabs you saw. Um, we just kept seeing them coming in uh, with, filled with people. Also, I probably should explain that I believe not all of them were like completely new converts. You guys might have to correct me. Um, they had this thing called, what was it, rice bag Christians? Because what would happen is they would give like a bag of rice to the people that wanted to be baptized. So, well, you can tell where that went. So you'd have all of these people that got baptized, but they never really learned or understood what they, that even meant. They did it for you know the rice bag. And so... Yeah, that was our main objective, actually, of going there. It was more of a revival meeting rather than a complete evangelistic series. Um, and, well, the only assurance we have on that is um, why we believe that. Um, at first, we were a bit skeptical. It was like, what if they're getting baptized and they don't really know what they're doing? They're just kind of like, oh, you know, everyone, there's a lot of people doing it. I'm going to do it. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the things um, that one of the pastors in India told us that um, I think if I'm correct, uh, Hindus get a, a, a um, certain amount of money from the government yeah. just simply because they're Hindus. Um, Muslims, they do get a small portion, not, not as, as well as uh, Hindus. But those who are Christian do not get any governmental help, like no funds whatsoever. So they knew, they knew that, that. So in becoming Christians, they knew that they're on their own from here on out. And uh, accepting all of these different principles that they would have to go through, they knew the trials that they had. So, and that really, that was really, um, it really showed us that, you know, they're not just, they know what they're doing. I actually don't have anything, but, uh, okay. One thing I learned from this trip, one thing I learned, yeah, I actually don't know, huh? <laughs> There's so many, but, like, you know, you got to, like, pick. So I won't be indecisive. I'll choose something. Okay, one thing I learned was that you don't have to have much to be content. These people were precious people with nothing. And so, just to see that this world, this country, in fact, it's 4th of July. Many people are barbecuing, raising their flags, living in their houses that are decked out. And it's sad to see that we take pride in this country, and yet we're still unsat we're not satisfied with what we have. We're still miserable. So it just goes to show that happiness isn't in possessions or money. Happiness is in experiences that are worth lasting. Like Moses, there was a ton of things that I was able to take away from the mission trip. But some of the, one of the top things that I really, I really learned was my that my own strength and my own knowledge and my own everything was never good enough to do, you know, to work for Christ. Um, I remember when we got there, you know, as Moses was kind of touched on, you know, we were all kind of, you know, doing our own thing, just trying to drive through, drive through it all, you know, in our own strength. And honestly, I did that for about a week of it. And <laughs> At the, at the end of that week, I was, I was probably in the, a very low point, emotionally, spiritually, socially, just everything. I was so burnt out because everything that I was doing, I was trying to, you know, do it 
in my own strength. And then once I chose to lean upon God and be like, God, you know, what I'm doing isn't me. It's, you know, let it be you. That's when, that's when my mission, that's when my experience during the mission strip started to take place. And I really started to enjoy it. And so that's one thing that I took away from it is my own self-sufficiency will never be good enough to work for Christ. I have to let him use me. Yeah. For me, I'd have to say something similar to Nathaniel, but I think I'll word it a bit differently. I think that enthusiasm is good, and enthusiasm can get you far, but I don't think enthusiasm can get you far for long. And that's the thing, because like a lot of us were excited to go there, but when you've been there for a while, your enthusiasm doesn't necessarily last you the whole trip, especially when you're working hard. So enthusiasm is good, and it's not wrong, but I think it can't be the only driving force you have. And so while enthusiasm is good, I think you need to temper that with commitment. You need to know and always keep at the front of your mind what you're doing. And I think that applies to anywhere. Because if we are to spread the gospel wherever we go, then we always need to remember what all of our actions are categorized by. Everything we do should be for that service of spreading the gospel. Um, well, I think one of the things, uh, one of the things that I learned was uh, I, I experienced in a different manner the power of prayer. I, you know, in this, in this mission trip, I, we all saw Satan working, and we saw him working hard. Even in the meetings, we had multiple technical difficulties. Actually, so in our meetings, we had, like, spotlights, um, and the electricity would go out randomly during our sermon. And I think in one of our sermons, it happened three times. And we, then our generator broke, and... Now, one time, we really saw Satan working, but through that, we saw God working even harder. And I really saw, when I prayed, some of them, well, no, I don't, I don't have time for a story. Um, but I really saw how God would answer prayer, and it was when I was at my lowest point, when I knew, I was like, I, I can't continue. Like, I physically cannot. And that, and this reminded me of the verse where God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. So that's something I learned. Something that impacted me a lot was the children. Um, I know, like, when you don't really know somebody, you know, you're respectful, of course. But I've seen kids here in America that, you know, like, or let's say we go over to their okay, you're invited to the house, but they, like, don't even say, like, hi to you, you know, say good morning. They're just, just very rude, right? And in India, they were just very kind. They were always saying good morning a lot, all the time. And um, they were just very nice and kind. And I could see, like, where we were staying was way much nicer than where they were. It looked, honestly, it looked like a prison or something. Like in one like room like this, there was a whole bunch of bunk, bunk beds and just like a little closet. And it was just, I could see how blessed we are here. And here in Washita, you know, there's a lot of um, complaints about it, food, where we stay, just whatever, and we don't realize how blessed we are, like, like a lot. And, you know, I learned that we need to be grateful for what we have, because there's a lot of people that don't have it and, you know, work for it, and they still can't manage to have what we have. Um, actually, they ate, I think, in the entire time that we were there, they ate the same thing every day, and only, everyone had their own plate, one plate, and they had washed that one plate every day and used the same plate every day. Um, so I have to kind of re-echo what 
two of my classmates already said because I think that the greatest lesson that I learned there was absolute reliance on the strength of God alone because um, I'm more like, people can notice this, but I'm more like introverted in nature. And the lady that I was working with, she was really excited to have young people working there and she wanted us to get as much of it as possible. So she asked me to do the children's story, the um, health talk, and the sermon for every night. She wasn't being lazy. She's just done a lot of mission trips before, so she wanted me to get a, a full experience of it. And so um, I gladly accepted, thinking that I could manage it, but um, a couple days later, I was just done. And I think there was this one particular day that we'd gone into town, and I came back. I was super tired. I did not have enough time to go over the sermon to prepare all the slides. And I got there, and I was like, Lord, I don't know what to say. Like, the sermon was on the Ten Commandments, and I had no idea what to say, because as Dylan explained, the sermons weren't really well catered to the audience. And I remember the entire time I was trying to write something down, and my mind blinked. And so the lady turned around, she gave me the microphone, and I stood up there. There was like these three seconds where I just closed my eyes, and I was like, Lord, this is all you. And then I started talking. And it's the most interesting explanation <laughs> on the Ten Commandments that I have ever heard, because I know that that wasn't me talking, that was the Lord. And I realized that when we truly, fully surrender to God, He can take you and He can do amazing things. And that doesn't mean don't prepare, but that just means when you try to rely on your own self and you think you're so smart and you think that, you know, oh, I got this, then that's the moment where we block God the most with our self-sufficiency. But it's those moments where we feel weak and when we feel like we got nothing. And when we let him take over, that he can truly bless. And so I think that's the greatest lesson that I learned there, and that's the greatest lesson that I can learn for life. It's just when you let him lead, he's going to lead, and he's going to turn something terrible into something wonderful. So, yeah. This morning we heard some about home missions and evangelism in Hot Springs from part of our senior class, and this part of our class is shared about their experience in India. We're thankful they get, they all got, to be involved in working for souls. And I know that it won't be until eternity that we'll see the full results of the work that they did there. Uh, mission trips are impactful. And we just um, know that it's not impacting just those who are being ministered to, but it impacts our own lives as we seek to minister. And we're very thankful for the work that all 10 of our seniors were able to do this year. And you know, the Lord's timing is always perfect. As we were looking for uh, mission trip opportunities, um, it, it just wasn't going together very well. And um, we, we prefer to have our mission trips in March and in, going into April. And there just wasn't anything available then. And, or, yeah, there wasn't anything available then. And uh, when we f were able to partner with It Is Written, which is our second year actually of partnering with them, it threw us into again this February uh, schedule. And... Uh, as I looked back on it shortly after they returned, I guess I thought, praise the Lord, they would not have gone anywhere in March because COVID was just really getting started well then in many of the places. And um, the other thing that had been looked at, suggested uh, for many years, our mission trips... Um, were in places that they could circle around and stop in Europe and do um, a Waldensian tour. And that, that's a, a very special experience. 
and um, but it it became more expensive and so we've just had to drop that out but again that was brought up to me um, and one of the people that had led the tour in the past said well maybe I could lead it and anyway you know where that would have put them right in northern Italy right in a real hot spot and they would have um, very likely had exposures well, no, I don't, I don't tell you everything we consider because I don't want you going up and down like I do emotionally when I'm working on this. Um, but I, I thought again, you know, the Lord is so good. He knew that they didn't belong that regardless of who gave what to help make it happen because of the impact that it potentially could have had on them. So um, God has been very good to us this year in spite of COVID, and I'm, I'm especially thankful for the way he led in both the timing for the Hot Springs meetings, the timing was perfectly in coinciding, oh, there was a few days different, but it, coinciding with the, the It Is Written trip, um, we looked and tried to set up several different um, opportunities to work with evangelists and and there was we just couldn't find anything available and here this was on our very doorstep and the students got to participate in the training that the theology students were also getting because they were getting prepared not only to attend um, David Machado's meetings but also to um, hold their own meetings and so it was, a, it was a really special opportunity for both groups, and we're just very thankful for the way the Lord led and that they were able to participate. We're so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Washington Hills College and Academy. If you've enjoyed the programs just as much as I did, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.